Well, uh, thanks for the welcome. I am not sure really how grateful you all really should be that I'm here. I feel like being the first uh, speaker at a conference with no breaks is it's a little bit like being the first leg of the Bataan Death March. Uh, you know, so all I, what I can tell you is this leg's going to be better than some of the others that uh, are coming, and I'd rather be the first leg than the last, I suppose. Um, well, when we think about Christianity and foreign policy, national security, uh, you know, and ask what what do these things have to do with one another? I uh, I'm s sort of torn because there's part of me that wants to say there's actually not a lot of connection in the sense of if you ask me what is a recipe for Christian cherry pie? You know, I would say well it's not that different from any cherry pie recipe, and that. The first, and the first thing that a Christian cherry pie has to be is a good cherry pie. And in that, it doesn't matter a whole lot who makes it. There's no special holy ingredient that goes into Christian cherry pie. Uh, some, I was once uh, countered by somebody who said, well, a Christian cherry pie is made with love. Um, <laughs> and perhaps that's true, but still, the concern with judging the pie as pie, it would be the same no matter who made it or whatever. And I think a lot of that is true of foreign policy. It doesn't help a bad foreign policy that the people who made it were trying to apply theological uh, criteria or Christian ethical criteria to it. And it doesn't matter in many ways to a good foreign policy if it was made by atheists who didn't give one single thought to religion while they were formulating it. So in that sense, um, not only is, is, is foreign policy not necessarily a religious activity, but it is something that you know, Christians and non-Christians, religious and non-religious people can collaborate on in a basis of real equality. And I think that's something that all of us maybe ought to remember especially in a country like this, which is multi-confessional. But at another level, actually, I think the relationship between Christianity and foreign policy is a very deep and important one, particularly, though not exclusively, in the American case. Uh, it seems to me that, that most American, most voices in American foreign policy today are shaped by or in the, in the shadow of a theological controversy, even though many of the participants in this conversation aren't aware of the theological roots of their worldviews uh, or of their, their foreign policy views and even their IR theoretical views are linked in at a very deep level to some theological issues. And the starting point for trying to understand how this works is to look at the way American history coincides with a global phenomenon, but one which has a lot of implications for us that I like to call the historicization of the eschaton. Now, isn't this already feeling more like a death march? <laughs> um, and what do we mean by the historicization of the eschaton, you might well ask. Um, and for me, what that means is this. Eschaton, as I'm sure all of you know, is a Greek word referring to the last, the end. And the eschaton is our sense of what happens at the end of the world. In a religious sense, the last judgment, the final things things that they talk about in the book of Revelations, et cetera, the apocalyptic. Um, that's always been present to the minds of people, a sense that the world as we know it may someday come to an end. And I think that's personally connected to our own awareness that we as individuals face death. We don't know when the apocalypse is coming for the whole world, 
but each of us personally is headed for an apocalypse where the stars will fall from the sky, the moon will turn to blood, and all kinds of other horrible things happen, and we'll be dead. So there is, there's a sense in which this historical vision of where we're all headed hooks into something very deep and personal uh, for all of us. But for most of human history, the idea of the last days, the eschaton, was not really connected to our ideas about a historical process. That is, for the world to end, something really supernatural was going to have to happen. Uh, God was going to have to do something big and dramatic to bring about the end of the world. Otherwise, it was just going to be one kingdom after another, one historical period after another. It would take a miracle to bring the world to the last days. And obviously, religious people expected and many were hoping for that miracle. Maranatha, Lord Jesus. So, in, however, beginning really in the 18th century, maybe a few traces of it earlier, we began to move to, as a culture to a place where the eschaton no longer had to be thought about in purely supernatural terms. We could think of history coming to some sort of an end, as my friend Frank Fukuyama would put it, as a result of human actions and a historical process. So you had the vision of the Enlightenment, for example, that the spread of knowledge and of scientific technology would gradually enlighten the human race, war would come to an end, tyranny would come to an end, all of these things that we think of as history would come to an end, and at some point in the future, humanity would have a happy life. And that was an eschatological idea, if you see what I mean. It was an end to, the, to, to history as we know it. Uh, Carlyle tells the story that in the years right before the, fr the French Revolution, um, the first balloon, they had the first balloon ascent from Mont Gaultier, and a French aristocrat watching this burst into tears. And one of her friends says, why are you crying? This is a magnificent achievement. She said, because I know it's now true. Someday science will find a way so that humanity will live forever, but I'll be dead before that happens. <laughs> Um, so that, and this coincides in religious, in, in Christian religious thinking with, with what you would call a post-millennial view of, of the apocalypse, that, that the spread of enlightenment and Christian principles would ch progressively change the world so that we have that thousand year reign, a, you know, millennial era of peace and prosperity. And then at the end, Jesus comes back to crown this process of enlightenment and progress, much though I suppose like the, the cherry on the top of an of a ice cream sundae to um, carry out the cherry pie metaphor. A very clever literary stitching. It's a, it's, it's a technique. Okay. Um, then we also have, you know, the, um, a, a somewhat darker view of the eschaton, uh, the um, premillennial, which suggests that things aren't going to end so well at least in the short term, that, that all the efforts at human science, at human enlightenment, at human striving are going to fail. The church will fail. And the, you know, there will be a reign of blood, of terror, of persecution. Humanity as a whole will turn its back on God. And then at the end will come this uh, you know, sort of cleansing act of God who transforms the world and brings finally sort of salvation, but out of, out of the ashes of human civilizational and cultural failure. So we have these two views. They are both Christian views. Um, they both 
come from people studying Holy Scripture, and they both have a resonance in people's sec in, in the thinking of secular and non-religious people as well. Now, America is a country whose existence, in a sense, begins with this view of a historic, that the eschaton is no longer a supernatural thing, but is actually a direction in which human history is observably marching. So America comes at a time of great, of the hope of the enlightenment, the hope that finally, you know, superstition is being cast aside. Um, priestcraft and kingcraft are being thrown away. Ordinary people who can read their Bibles and study the laws of science and nature have the ability through their common sense reasoning to reach true conclusions. The grace of God is flowing through a revived and purified church and the principles of, um, uh, of Christian living are now daily transforming the way the world works. For Anglo-Americans, this was a reading of history that, that was almost second nature. You know, they're, they're reading, if you lived in sort of 1780, 1800, the way you'd be looking in the English-speaking world at the past was that you know, you had the ancient world and it was terrific, the principle, Greece and Rome, you had liberty, you had republic, and then you had, you know, Jesus comes and gives like the true religion, you have the apostolic church, but then a long period of darkness, of uh, despotism in the secular world, of uh, papism in the religious world, tyranny, superstition, and there's a degradation of the human experience, then you get first the Renaissance beginning to recover the languages and the learning of the ancient world, the ideals. The Reformation follows immediately afterwards, which introduces, you know, purifies religious principles, and we get back to the sources, to that golden era. And then in, in politics and, and life, you get... English liberty triumphing through uh, Oliver Cromwell, but even afterwards, England you know, discover, rediscovers the principles of both market freedom and civil governance and sound Protestant religion. And now this dynamo, which in fact is becoming the most powerful country in the world, the UK, but is also leading a civilizational and global transformation. The Americans then take their own view and say, well, the English have fallen by the wayside. They didn't really get it completely, but we do. And they say the future of the United States is a world transforming arc um, in which these true principles now finally allowed to live free are going to transform the world. The American missionary movement of the 19th century, they go out to China, and yes, they're trying to make the Chinese Christian, but they also believe that these Christian principles in China will, will end the you know, foot binding, despotism, uh, wage, uh, debt peonage, all these other social horrors. And so they're bringing a light that is both civil and religious to the world. And it is America's mission, duty, and principle, uh, uh, response, and, and privilege to play a key role in world transformation. That's a pretty foundational element of the American approach to foreign policy, which we certainly still find today. Uh, NGOs, State Department office, offices on religious liberty, on, on human rights, and so on. The human rights agenda that was incorporated into the uni uh, Universal Declaration of the United Nations on Human Rights. These things historically come right out of that missionary movement and the sense of America as a country with a vocation comes out of this optimistic spirit 
of 18th, 19th century Protestantism, which is feeling its power, feel, seeing all around that the countries that embrace the principles of Christianity do better than the countries that don't, and the countries within the Christian world who are Protestant are doing better than those poor, benighted Orthodox and Catholic countries, which is the way the world looked to people in places like the United States in the 19th century. Um, so, this progressive, the, this concept that the goal of foreign policy is to serve a progressive and transformative end is as American as apple pie, if not cherry pie, linking again in a very clever way, uh, and uh, is something, it, it's a debate that continues and you can see in American society that the darker view of the historicizing eschaton is also present. So, you know, we, it's, the human race may not bring about the end of history simply by solving all of our social and moral and civilizational problems so that we just coast into the millennium, but alternatively, we may foul things up so badly that we destroy ourselves. So, you know, we can kill ourselves with nuclear weapons. Um, we, humanity could fall victim to a totalitarian ideology like National Socialism, like Communism, that, you know, in a sense, the powers of evil can win the historical battle against the powers of good. And by the way, Americans during the Cold War, there was this sense of on the one hand, there's the communist threat to everything that is good and decent about human life. And then on the other hand, there's the nuclear threat to human life. And you've got to steer a path between these. You've got to defeat communism while avoiding nuclear annihilation. That's a kind of a tall order. Um, so, but, but it puts American policy even today in a kind of an apocalyptic framework. And the you know, people in the in the green movement will say that the that climate change is posing a fundamental threat to the survival of the human race. In other words, if we don't solve political problems and political foreign policy problems in an ordinary political way, we get to an apocalyptic result, the end of human civilization or even the end of human life. We can also see in the progress of technology, um, the possibility, and people talk about, particularly in Silicon Valley, people talk this way, about actually sort of messing with the tree of life, so to speak, recoding human DNA so that we recreate ourselves as a species, uh, finding computer analogs for human consciousness, which might either in, uh, lead to truly self-aware, autonomous, uh, au uh, automatic intelligence or artificial intelligence, or alternatively that human beings could upload their consciousness to computers and so survive after death in some way, after physical death, and who knows then download into a cloned body or what have you. All of these kinds of of things that to our ancestors would have looked to be sort of only things that supernatural traffic with demons or angels or something could get you are now things that people who are, you know, reasonably well grounded. Am I hearing myself here? I don't know. I've heard some kind of an echo there. Sorry. Uh, the people reasonably well grounded as part of you know, intelligent American society now think these are real possibilities and are even investing money in companies which they hope will move us toward these purposes. So what we see now is that the realm of history and therefore the realm of foreign policy has gotten itself all mixed up in the realms that formerly would have been reserved for a religious or theological understanding of the eschaton 
of the end of human life and the meaning of human life. So I think from here it should be a, a, a pretty clear step to, to understand that Christians have a unique ability maybe to look at these theological issues, think them through, and bring a clear intelligence to these fundamental and very troubling questions. You know, the, the reality that we are at this point of um, uh, sort of apocalyptic tension drives a lot of the fanatical movements that we see around the world. It was certainly one of the engines of communism, but if you think about movements like ISIS and some other terrorist movements, these are movements by people who feel that everything is at stake and that what we do historically as human beings can either bring on the apocalypse in a good sense or we will stand by while everything we value as good Muslims or whatever we may be uh, is destroyed by forces of secularism, by other religions and what have you. So in the midst of this chaos and confusion, one would hope that what Christians can do is maybe bring two things to bear. One is a kind of skepticism about being so sure where the eschaton is going. I mean, it's so, it's one of the most interesting things to me is you read the New Testament, you study what Jesus says about um, you know, his return or last judgment, end of times, and the one thing that you see from this is that nobody knows when it's coming and nobody can really understand what it will look like. And then if we look at the way that, the, that Jesus is coming as a Messiah, was so unexpected, so contrary to all the, the expectations that people in, his, in, in the Jewish community had of what, their, what the Messiah would be like and what he would accomplish. It was just so completely different that a lot of people just couldn't even recognize what was happening. And it may be that the second coming will be sort of like that too. It'll take us by surprise. We won't be able to predict it and we won't even be so sure what's happening when it's happening. I mean, that's the only precedent we've got for this. But in any case, Christians, I think, have to stand grounded in the reality that as a species we could be headed for a really good end of history. We could solve a lot of problems. We could eliminate poverty. We could live in a sustainable way with the environment. We could get to a better place among nations, but we're not necessarily going to do it because we could also fail. And we could also see the decisive destruction of everything that, that we value, that makes life meaningful. And here, I think, is the second thing that Christians can, can bring to the table is faith. That in this historical storm in which we live, where the stakes are clearly cosmic and the outcome is unpredictable, it's very important to be able to say, there is a God who I can, who I trust, who I depend on, who is faithful. And the outcome of all this is in his hands. That, that gives us the courage and the strength and I think the sort of rock of character and inner stability to be able to function effectively in the face of the overwhelming stress and chaos and danger of the times in which we've been called to live. So Christianity, you'll notice, I'm saying, is not really providing any answers. I myself don't think Christianity can tell us whether the next 30 years are going to be good or bad. Uh, I think Christianity can offer a theological explanation for either direction. Um, I don't think Christianity can tell us whether, you know, where the boundary between the Israelis and the Palestinians should be, 
or you know what it should our stand be on the Paris Accord. Um, there are a lot of questions that Christianity does not provide a special secret answer to that you get by decoding Bible verses or any other method. Again, cherry pie is cherry pie. Good cherry pie and bad cherry pie are not religious and irreligious cherry pie. But the question of what, whether, whether we have the ability as people, the moral center, the fortitude, the clarity of theological understanding uh, to, to make intelligent decisions in the maelstrom of history that is shaping up around us, that has a lot to do with faith a lot to do with Christianity. And I hope that the people in this room, should you be so fortunate as to survive the death march on which you have embarked, um, <laughs> that you will make distinct and important contributions to this, uh, to this very critical period in which we're living. So that's a kind of an overview of, of my thinking on this topic. I'll be happy to take questions and open this up for conversation and discussion. Thank you very much. Is that working? Oh, all right, very good. Thank you, Walter. We're going to take questions. I'm going to start off with the first question. Um, and what I hope to do is to model you can tell me if I accomplish this, that a question typically is a short interrogative ending in a question mark. Um, I realize we're going to have to preface things occasionally, but let's try to keep it limited so we can get as many questions in as possible. Um, but I'm going to operate uh, the, uh, the moderator's prerogative to ask the first question. Uh, you illustrate nicely how the 20th century demonstrates the horrors that can happen when you try to immunitize or historicize the eschaton. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to dampen the humanitarian impulses of the human heart. So how do you navigate between an ambition for charity uh, abroad, say, to, to not try to defeat evil in time, but to defeat some evils maybe one at a time, while not trying to immunitize the eschaton? What are some of the practical outcomes that we could look for? Well, one thing is I tend to favor the separation of church and state a bit. And I think that, that we've gotten in this country a little bit over, we've gone a bit over the line in terms of the US government becoming the, you know, the, the, age, the change agent, uh, the missionary. Uh, so I'm not sure that the US government should be operating an office in another country that aims to change the form of government of that country. And I think the blowback you know, in some ways, the Russian interference in American politics can be seen as sort of their blowback for our very clear efforts to change Russian polity and Russian politics through various NGOs or actually quasi NGOs, uh, ap apparently independent uh, groups that are actually funded by government. Uh, so I actually think that that the missionary movement is a great example of American civil society engaging constructively with the world, both in a, um, a, a, a religious form and also in a humanitarian and social form. And that the, the ties in universities, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of international students who over the years have come to the United States to study uh, this has been terrific. So I think there are, th are some things that the government can do, but I think we, we can't forget that government has a set of tasks related to sort of geopolitical stability and the protection of core vital national U.S. interests that don't always align in a simple way with, um, you know, a sort of zeal for democracy. So it, it may well be that the United States needs a stable Egypt uh, and that our government has no powerful power or ability to bring about a democratic Egypt. So we've probably strayed a bit over the line and we, we've, gone, we've gotten ahead of ourselves 
in trying to make the American government an instrument of global reform. I don't think we should, you know, I certainly don't think things like disaster relief and some other things we should pull back from completely, but I think we, we need to, in order to do what we can do well, well, we need to think really hard about what the limits of government's role as, as, as a social worker abroad can be. Are you comfortable taking the questions? You can uh, I, yeah, I can do that or... Uh, we've got a microphone that will be coming around. If you want to introduce yourself, say briefly. Okay, I see one over here. Yeah, please do introduce yourself. I'm Brian Benson. I'm at uh, George Mason University. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on Augustine's uh, City of God. It is, it's some t thought by some to be the first serious effort at Christian political theory, mm -hmm. but it seems to me he's, he's grappling with exactly what you've been discussing, which is, how, what is the, how, how can Christian thinking inform uh, political action in a, in, in, in a meaningful way with, without getting lost in the weeds? Well, I think, I mean, I, I do think that is, you know, one of his contributions is to kind of carve out the path there. I would say that, that overall, Christians who think about these issues, and for that matter, sort of idealistic non-Christians who, who think about these matters, keep running up against, you know, sort of the Machiavellian problem that, that the prince who lives to do good may not be a good prince. Uh, that, um, you know, in, in, if, you, if you're like so eager to obey all the ethical rules that you can think of that you lose control of your kingdom or you allow, you get deceived by enemies or you, whatever, um, that the consequences are worse than if you'd been a, a conniving Luc Lucretia Borgia or something. So, um, you know, this ethical dilemma at the heart of Christian thinking of statesmanship remains, and it's, you know, it's fundamentally how do you institute and defend good rule in a world of fallen people? You know, and this is, this is where I think Christianity has something to say with the idea of the fall as a corruption of human nature. Uh, we, we can't make, have government on the assumption that everybody is good. And that, of course, includes governors as well as the governed. I think some of the answers we've come up with in the United States of limited powers, rule of law, and so on, while not perfect, you know, they're, 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 they're pretty good. At least they've worked for us reasonably well. Uh, but I don't think that Augustine or anybody else, I don't think Christianity is going to produce a cookbook for foreign policy or for domestic policy, for that matter. Yes, right over there. To stay on the uh, Machiavelli line. Uh, who are you? Oh, Daniel Strand, Arizona State University. Uh, uh, national interest, the, the, you know, the big conceptual idea of national interest, um, uh, seems to be controversial in academia, of course. Uh, um, America, or, or you know, the, the the big themes are global citizenship. You know, we're 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 people of the world, sort of cosmopolitanism, and then uh, I think with with Trump and the sort of backlash to the sort of the more global and international impulses in American foreign policy, you see a return to the supremacy of of national interests, right? It, only national interests versus a sort of benign globalism. Um, how, how do you think? Christianity should inform our thinking about national interest. How, how are we supposed to grapple with this? I think it's kind of tracking on the, the previous question, but I'd like right. to he hear your thoughts on it. Again, I think this, uh, this question of national interest versus sort of universal human interest, shall we say, is one of those ones that goes to the core of, of Abrahamic religion. Once, you know, so God chooses a people. Um, and we have, a, we have a universal God 
whose morality, who, you know, who mat matters to everyone, the creator of the whole universe, but then chooses a particular people uh, to, to be his instrument, you know, to have a special relationship with. And that, you know, that tension between the, the specificity of this, of this people and the universality of God and, and morality haunts uh, the Jewish faith all through the biblical era. And some, you know, we, we think about some of the debates in Israel and in the American Jewish community over Israel and the Palestinians, Israel and its neighbors. We see these same questions coming up today. And obviously they're true in other cases. You know, do I have a duty to other Americans that I don't have to everybody in the world? Um, that's in a, you know, so a hurricane hits Puerto Rico where they're American citizens. Is that a call to me in a way that a hurricane hitting another country isn't? That's a hard thing, you know, I, I, that, again, this is not one of those things that you get some like obvious, you know, go to, go to page 17 and look in chapter three and there's going to be your answer. I would tend to say this, that for there to be any kind of effect, that, that human beings are made in such a way that we act politically through communities, through commonalities of feeling, historical experience, mutual loyalty. Um, and so I don't think you can be a good cosmopolitan if you're not a good American or French person, you know, whatever your, your citizenship or affinity may be. I think if you're not, I think if, if, if all states around the world were only held together by the rather weak bonds that unite people on a cosmopolitan basis, I don't think many governments would be able to do much of anything and I think a lot of problems wouldn't be solved. On the other hand, obviously, if we all become sort of fanatical fascist, um, pa super patriots and chauvinists who see the universe as a zero-sum game and just want to screw the other people, and we, you know, we have an idolatrous relationship with our own national identity, that way lies disaster too. I think 20th century history has been very good at showing us that the cosmopolitanism of, of com totalitarian communism, uh, which is against all nations and so on, is, produces a graveyard and so does the idolatry of national socialism, of, of Nazism. Uh, so you take either of these to the extreme and you get something unspeakable, which suggests again that what you've got to do is to try to integrate them creatively so that you are, you are a good and loving and loyal citizen of your own nation, member of your local community and family, but nevertheless you recognize kinship. I notice in the Bible one of the ways this is done uh, in, in, uh, is you think about the, the immense stress placed on hospitality in the ancient world, not just among Jews, but, but frequently, that that's almost one of the ways that you tell good people from bad people. And it's through the exercise of the virtue of hospitality, that's how you pay tribute to the universality of your moral obligations and the sort of the, you know, that, that we're all children of the same God and we are bound by deep ties with one another. So that I think is a, is a way to maybe begin a reflection on how do you integrate these things. You gotta have a home in order to be able to be hospitable, but when you have a home, you damn well better be hospitable. Other questions? We have one over here. Hi, my name is Kyle Hansen. I'm a student at University of Texas El Paso master's program there. Um, a lot of what you're saying I kind of see in readings from, you know, American historical writers in the time period that you're talking about. But also there's a lot of talk about um, the religious context that the views of human nature 
have upon both systems of government, like the American system of government, as well as possibly international relations theory. So in, in my view, kind of like theology, um, probably where it most touches politics could be views of human nature and also eschatology. And of course, you touched more on the eschatology. Um, even in views of human nature, like the questions are, the eschatological question is how good can or will history get? But the human nature question, which I think kind of precedes it, is how good can or will people get? And that kind of precedes the eschatological one. So my question to you is, do you think views of human nature should inform Christians as a more definitive way of looking at, at IR questions or foreign policy before eschatological ones? Because it's more, I believe the Bible is a little bit more definitive about human nature. And um, so I'll leave you that as a question. Well, again, I mean, you know, to say that, okay, you know, the, the trouble is when you think about the Constitutional Convention, you know, people forming our, our system of government, you had some pretty dyed-in-the-wool serious Calvinists, and then you had people like Benjamin Franklin. So our system of government does not reflect a single view of human nature. Um, the, the people who signed and voted for that Constitution came from a wide variety of, of philosophical points of view, and yet they, they still found a certain common ground. So that'd be one problem. Um, but another is that, okay, if I say that humanity is fallen and we are not going to achieve perfection, and yet also at the same time that God is at work in the world and has sent his Holy Spirit into the world to transform people, it's kind of hard to translate that into, okay, how good are they going to get? You know, and how many of them are going to get how good? We don't know where the Spirit comes from, where it's going, right? So, so I can, like, tell you some basic, I can recite some points of view in the catechism, but they don't actually tell me how well the people of Arkansas are going to respond to some event in Arkansas. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think we have to actually, you know, we, uh, certainly we have to have some clarity about these foundational beliefs and understanding our theological views, our, our, our hermeneutics. But at the same time, when it comes to the evaluation of practical phenomena and making actual choices and calculations, we have to be very, very careful. And, and very often, the people who make the worst mistakes are people who try to rigidly go from a sound theological position to some kind of contingent political strategy. In the back, yes, you. I am Daniel Ding, South Sudanese American. You explain better Askatan, Christianity uh, Askatan. So my question is, what is an Askatan of foreign policy? What's an Askatan of foreign policy? Um, well, for example, I mean, well, foreign policy might be related to the eschaton in the sense that, um, well, I guess maybe the easiest way to say it is it seems to me that, that 1945 was the year that opened the historical era in which all of us live. And two things happened in that year. Uh, the, the first, chronologically, was that as the Red Army moved farther into Nazi-occupied Europe, the concentration camps and the extermination camps uh, were open to view. And so the, the news of this terrible crime uh, began to permeate the world. And for people in a Western context, this, was, this had, a, this had a enormous significance because it basically torpedoes the idea that the Enlightenment is going to save us. You know, because, because this idea is that science and education will cure what's wrong with the human spirit, or at least enough of what's wrong with the human spirit, that we're going to have a kind of a moral progress. 
But here we saw in Germany the best educated, you know, country deeply, deeply permeated with both the religious and the secular ideologies of enlightenment and modernity, you know, comes, comes out of this kind of crime that you would read about in the Bible where some horrible pharaoh tries to kill the people of God. Um, so you have that on the one side, and then you have Hiroshima and Nagasaki later in the year where the technology that was supposed to power this failed enlightenment has, however, placed the weapons of ultimate destruction in the hands of people who've been revealed to be fallible and flawed no matter how well educated or technically competent they can be. So at the same time that technological progress is moving to a new height, we're being very powerfully told that technological progress, far from being the solution to all of our problems, actually may be an engine of even deeper ones. And what that does is for foreign policy, it, it forces foreign policy to deal directly with questions in a sense of ultimate good and evil, which in, I think, the world of foreign policy, it's kind of eschatological right there. So that Harry Truman, who's elect, who, you know, becomes vice president in an ordinary way as a machine politician from Missouri without a college education or much knowledge of the wider world, is suddenly having to make these decisions. So the eschaton has arrived for foreign policy. It's here. Yes. You. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Ashlyn Webb. I'm a student at UT Austin. Um, my question is on the difference between a public facing faith and a personal one, because a lot of the tensions that you seem to be describing exist between when you take Christianity and try to impose then that you're going to have some textbook answers to things. And obviously it doesn't work that way. But I wonder if that means that that prevents you from using your faith in a public facing way, or if in reality as Christians, what we might be called to do is to have a personal faith that then informs our decision making, um, rather than to bring theologically based questions into the public debate itself. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think um, religious faith should simply be a private thing that we don't discuss in public. Um, and it seems to me whether, you know, I, I often speak, I speak around the world on American foreign policy, I often find myself speaking to non-Christian audiences, and I find it's actually helpful to, to show them how some of the ideas I'm talking about are rooted in, in Christian theology, um, simply so they can kind of see more clearly what I'm, what I'm talking about and what it, what it means, and then try to make sense of it coming from their context. So I think you, you have to. What I'm, what I'm urging against, and this is true in private life as well as personal life, you know, that, that religion is not a cookbook. Um, and I think for Christianity, this is, this is even more the case. You know, our job is not to go to the books of, uh, you know, to the Talmud. Our job is not to go to look to Sharia law where you know, divine, you know, we've got the divine instructions for how you treat your eldest son and your eldest daughter and so on and so forth. And you know, we do actually have recipes for religious and non-religious cherry pie and many other things. You know, Christianity is not that. In fact, that's maybe the biggest difference between Christianity and other religions in terms of daily life, there is no Christian dress, there is no Christian diet, there is no Christian inheritance law, right? Jesus gave us none of that. So in that sense, both in the personal realm and in the public realm, um, we, we have to represent a faith which is absolute, but which doesn't yield kind of, you know, 
infallible divine guidance for each and every decision point during the day and modeling that mix of faith that is, that is confident and solid and deep, but on the other hand, an openness to you know, transitory events and pragmatic considerations and that you can never quite fully, you know, you, you just don't have the rule book that's gonna, that's gonna answer every question. That's part of what being a Christian, I think, is about. And, and so I think we just have to keep doing that. Yes. My name is Jonathan Pavlik, uh, Arlington, Virginia, independent scholar, uh, recently retired from the World Bank uh, as a lawyer. Uh, Walter, uh, you're, I heard all what you said about the eschaton being the kind of compass, if you will, driving the Christian approach to national security or national interest or uh, national mission, uh, as you understand it. But in, especially in light of your response to this last question, I'm still troubled by how much are you throwing out the, the, the recipe? I think I'm uh, hearing and still dedicated to a, a view that Christianity in some respect is a recapitulation of an older prescription. Let's say, uh, the nation of Israel, uh, the, the directions Moses gave uh, from God about the conquest of Canaan, how you treat the cities that stand in the way versus how you treat the cities that are actually in the, the promised land and, and you know, should offer them terms of peace. There's some sense of a, a set of instructions and you know, the, the Puritans, the, the pilgrims, they were, they were motivated, weren't they, by a, a sense of recapitulation or re-enactment of uh, the, uh, the mission of, the, of God's people conquering Canaan, that now Christianity or Christendom was a kind of a, a chance to do it right and progress it further. So rather than looking constantly forward to the eschaton and where we will uh, pres presume that God has ordained for us to end up and trying to advance there, we're being built up constantly on the relics of the past and, and the, the, the roots that have been laid down there. How heavily, uh, again, I'm challenging you, are you willing to discard, disparage, and throw away the recipe that has been given from, say, the, the Law of Moses and uh, whether it was the Talmud or the uh, ancient Christian scholars, uh, dedication to that idea of recapitulation of the, the mission of the, uh, the nation of Israel? Well, I'd say I probably repudiate it utterly and totally. Um, that it seems to me that the Puritans were at their worst when they decided we are the new Israelites and the Indians are the new Canaanites and we're basically going to kill them and take their land. Uh, that was a horrible crime. And the same thing with the Boers who had the same, you know, the Boers were Dutch Protestants and they took the same attitude toward many of the black South Africans. These were horrible crimes. Nobody, they were not the nation of Israel, and these people were not Canaanites, but they arrogantly decided to view themselves in that way, and as a result, they committed crimes. So, um, you know, I, I think we, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that Puritan New England has nothing to teach us. They have a lot to teach us. Uh, but, but on that particular point, I think they're, they're, the instruction we can draw is negative rather than positive. Don't do it that way. Uh, America has enemies in the world. Um, we have a right, a, a clear right to defend ourselves against these enemies. Um, as we do that, there are, you know, there are limits on the ways we can, I think, morally fight them, but, but it, well, we really do have a legitimate right of self-defense. Uh, the Palestinians today are not actually the descendants of Canaanites in particular. Uh, so, you know, to try to apply these things from the, 
the Old Testament uh, sort of civil law and all, you know, I don't, I, I don't favor, you know, I actually think we probably should let witches live, for example. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, you know, and and I'm I'm a hundred percent against killing adulterers. So I, you know, I actually think that you know one of the important elements of Christianity is this: yes, we are heirs to a long pre-Christian formation, and and Jesus is the fulfillment of, of um, the Israelite religion. And we have a special, I believe we have a special relationship as Christians with Jews to this day. Um, but I think that the, the contribution that we have to make as Christians is to reflect critically on the before and the after and integrate from a way where we're not just borrowing up. Now, if I've, if I've sort of been, uh, unfair to, you know, sort of simplify the, the, the comparisons you're trying to make, I'm sorry. Um, we have, we don't have a lot of time and all, and I'm just trying to raise what I see as the highlights. But it really does seem to me that sort of thinking of ourselves as the new Israel that has the right to occupy the land and, and so on, I, I, I just don't get that. Walter, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, well, we have one right here. Hi, Faith McDonald from the Institute on Religion and Democracy. Um, one of the things that uh, I see about Western government forces that believe in basically a secular eschaton, I mean, it is to them a religion, or we would see it as a religion, but it's secular to them, um, is that they have a very different view of the rest of the world than we as Christians should have in terms of, um, I'm just thinking of, where the Bible says that every tribe and tongue will come before the Lord. Um, and this also connects with what you were just saying about we have a right to defend ourselves. Other nations also have a right to defend themselves, but sometimes our secular eschaton thinks they know better because, for instance, this nation is in Africa and we're trying to take over um, their defense and not allow them to defend themselves. Um, not take over their defense, but stop them from defending themselves. So just in terms of, as Christians, looking at that, can you say something about um, the, the use of moral equivalence in a secular eschaton versus right and wrong? Well, you know, one thing I would say is that Americans generally, whether we're religious or secular, have a sort of a tendency, you know, we're like the Germans, I think, in this. We, we have an instinct for the higher ground. Uh, we want to be, we want to be the enlightened ones who know best telling others how to live. And again, ideally, among Christians, our sense of our own personal sinfulness the, and, and of the universality of God and the transcendence of God of our categories makes us tolerant and self-reflective and sort of tr we work a little harder to see things from the other point of view. I can't say as a matter of historical fact that American Christians have always behaved in this way. And I think the intolerance and the self-righteousness that we sometimes see among some of the sort of secular enlightened people who think that they have, you know, they have received the special light that tells them how everyone else should live. Uh, best thing to do about that maybe as a Christian is to think about that as a mirror in which, you know, you ask yourself, is that my reflection that I'm seeing that I object to so strongly? Um, you know, and, and having gone through that process, maybe we can, we can reach some of these folks. But it is, it is definitely the case that the combination of the ha relative happiness of American history, where by and large things have gone reasonably well for most people, and, and we've been reasonably successful at growing our power internationally and growing our economy and so on at home, gives us a, a tremendous foundation of smugness. 
perhaps slightly checked by the events of, of recent years in our politics, but, but overall fundamentally a kind of smugness. And, um, and Americans start from that standpoint, whether we're liberal or conservative, religious or secular, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, it's just part of the air we breathe. And it's, you know, so you just have to check ourselves a bit, that's all. Um, and, and realize that uh, good is, you know, as, as much light as we've achieved, we may not yet finally be perfect. Thank you very much.